Okay, as you can see, this week's topic is tables and cross tabulations, uh, chi-square and reporting results. And this is the week in which you actually do a statistical test. And I'll talk more about what that is uh, in a little bit, uh, in a few moments. So tables and cross tabulations is the main thing. Laying things out in tables, otherwise called cross tabulations, and seeing how you can talk about that data and what you can analyse from it, what you can see from it. Okay. Um, let me start with um, uh, this, um, this slide, descriptive versus inferential stats. So far, the statistics I've talked about, particularly in the session last week, or sorry, two weeks ago, um, are what are called descriptive uh, statistics. Things that describe the distribution. They tell you where the middle is, tell you how, how well spread out it is, and so on. So things like the mean, the median, the mode, the standard deviation, uh, and so on, the, the, the interquartile range, are all ways of describing the, the, the figures you've got, the statistics, if you like, that, that do that. And they're referred to as descriptive statistics. What I'm going to go on to talk about this week, though, is a different kind of statistic, which is the inferential and this enables us to make decisions about how those variables are related. So how one thing in your data set relates to something else, how one variable relates to another uh, variable. To draw conclusions or even to make generalizations about those figures. By generalizations, what I mean there is taking <coughs> it from your sample to the population from which that sample was drawn. So we can make decisions about whether those relationships are significant, uh, what they mean, and so on, on the basis of these inferential statistics. And the chi-square to talk about this week is one of those statistics, inferential statistics. It now enables us, called inferential, because we can infer a certain kind of significance based on the values we get in those statistics. Okay. Um, well, I've already talked about relationships. We're looking at relationships here. And the kind of relationships I'm talking about this week and that you'll be doing in the labs are those expressed through tables. Through, uh, they're often called contingency tables or cross tabulations. And what they are is an arrangement, just like I talked about a few weeks ago in, in the, the data matrix, of rows and columns. In this case, of course, the, 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 both the rows and the columns are variables from your data set. And what in, included in the cells is the, the actual counts, how many individuals fell into that cell. In other words, they had a value that was both for that column and for that row. The variables we can use here are generally nominal or categorical variables. Um, but you can include some ordinal ones too, things where you've got a scale of, you know, from one to five, things like that you can include. But you don't want too many values. Um, usually it makes sense to have a just a few values. And that's why nominal and categorical tend to be what we use. In fact, if you're using ordinal variables, um, then there are better tests to use than chi-squared. So you might still produce a table, but there are better ways of testing the relationships. So what I'll be focusing on today is nominal or categorical variables. That is, variables where we're simply sorting our respondents into categories. They're one of those, or one of those, or one of those. They're male or female. They're aged that group, they're aged in that group, or aged in that group, and so on. So that's what nominal or categorical means. As I said, the table contains the counts or the frequencies of those individuals. Any particular cell in the table uh, contains the number of individuals that fall into that column and that row um, in, in the, the table. So one variable is spread across the, the horizontal axis and different columns, therefore, represent different values of that variable. And the other variable is spread across the different, on the vertical axis, across the different rows, so that each row indicates a particular value for that variable. And we have also in the margins, so on the, what we tend to do is on the right-hand side and on the bottom of the table, we have counts of often the total number of people. So the total number of people who were in across all those different variables, values, for that row, and so the number of in individuals in that row, and then the same for the columns, so the column totals as well, the actual numbers of individuals <coughs> that fall into that column in total. 
let's have a look at an example. Um, I've gone back to this data set again that I've used before. Uh, you don't need to look at the details of the actual values, but a very simple one of, of um, a, a, a class from many years ago, the health and illness course. It's quite a small data set, 34 individuals. And I've got information on here about their gender, uh, their sex on, on, in this column, male and female. And I'm going to use the one on the far right, which is the age group. And I've recoded the age into those who are under 21 and those who are 21 and over. Um, so I'm going to ask the question, are women more likely to be under 21 than men? So you might say, are, are women, you know, did more women tend to be in the younger age group than, than, than men in that age group? And if I were to just simply count up these, in fact, and I'll show you in a moment how to do this in SPSS, it's a couple of clicks and you do it, but if you rearrange all the data, this is the table you get, a very simple table. In fact, the simplest of the contingency tables that you can produce. It's a two by two table, and there's, there's actually uh, some reason for focusing on that in just a moment, I'll tell you. But what you can see is you've got two columns for the two values of the variable sex, male and female. And you've got two rows, under 21s, 21 and over, for the two values of the age group variable. And inside the cells, the numbers 3, 13, 6 and 12, are the actual number of individuals. And you can see I've got the marginals in, on the, the far right. That I've got 16 altogether under 21, both male and female altogether. Uh, and I've got 18, 21 and over, making a total of 34 people in the, the whole group. Now, what we want to ask is, is there a relationship? Is there a relationship between the gender and those who are in the rows? So is there some sense in which there are more males in the younger age group than we might expect and more females or more, or more females than we might expect in the younger age group? Now, the problem here is, of course, that the actual totals are different. It's not easy to compare 3 with 13 because you've got nine males altogether and 25 females altogether. So you have to do a little bit of calculation in your head to, to work out what that means. Is three bigger than, it, than, than 13, given that you've got 25 um, women altogether in the group? Um, and what we do is we produce some percentages that help us understand that. Here's uh, one way of doing that, um, comparing the, the ages of the male and females by producing column percentages. So what we're doing is producing a percentage for the number of individuals in that cell for that column as a whole. So I'm saying of the three males under 21, what's the percentage of that of all the males in that column? Three out of nine is one third. And you can see here I've got 33%. So that's, that's, that's the percentage. So for the females under 21, you take the, the actual number in here, that's 13. Divide by 25, multiply by 100 to make a percent, that's 52%. Now, you have to do this. All of this is being done for you by the program. That's why we have computers to do things like this. But I'm illustrating this because this is what's going on behind the scenes. Now, the point about doing this is we can now compare the columns. We can say both the columns are at 100%, so we've evened out those differences of numbers of males and females. And we can see now more clearly that of the males, only a third are under 21, but of the females, 52% are under 21. So in this data set, we've got a clear difference. There are more females in the younger age group than there are men. Now, that's certainly true of that particular group of individuals. Is it true of all people on all courses and so on, that we, you know, if we sample a larger population, is it true of all of those? We don't know that. We know it's true of our particular sample, but we might want to talk about whether it's true of a more general population from which our sample is taken, students doing this kind of course at university. So I'll come back to that in a moment, how you, how you do that. But let me, before I, I do that, we're going to be using SPSS for this. So that's my very simple table. In fact, even simpler is that table there. But here's my very simple two-by-two two table. If you do a printout from SPSS and you tick all the boxes, uh, there are various options to include things. If you tick all the boxes for all the options, you get a rather complex table like this. But in fact, this is the same table as the one I've just shown you. So if I go back two to there, the 3, 13, 6 and 12 are all here. Um, the 13 is at the top of the, the first box, the, the female under 21s. Um, 
Oh, sorry, I think I've swapped around the, the female and male columns, haven't I? Uh, slightly differently. Uh, so the 13 should have been on the right, but it's now on the left. Uh, don't, that doesn't really matter at all. Um, and the 12 and 6 are, are down below. But in addition, I've got an expected count. I've got a percentage within the age group. So that is the percentage across the row. So it adds up to 100% across the row. And I've also done as well, which I've already done for you, the column percentages, the percentage within the sex of students. So 52% of females are uh, under 21, 48% over 21, 21 and over rather. Um, so that's done for you as well. And it also does percentages and expected values for the marginals as well. So you get a lot of numbers on the sheet if, if you're not careful, if you tick all the boxes. You don't have to do that. You have an option in SPSS to decide which of these extra percentages, expected values you want. So it's up to you to print out what makes sense to talk through the table and see the pattern. Some people in the video I'm about to show you, um, he actually uses the expected counts as a way of working out what the pattern is. And you could do that here. You could say, if we have, of the females, uh, if we assume that they're distributed in the age groups as the group as a whole is, that's both male and female together, then we'd expect 11.8 females in the first cell rather than 13. If we had the same for the males spread across the, the groups in that expected fashion, we'd expect 4.2, but we've actually got three. Um, so for the females, we have more than expected, and for the males, we have fewer than expected. And that suggests that there's a pattern there, the pattern I've just told you, which is there are, there are basically fewer, um, sorry, uh, more males um, in the, the older age group and more females in the younger age group than you might expect. There's one other thing about this table to bear in mind, that is expected counts. Uh, one of the problems with using a statistic, the chi-square statistic on this, is that if you've got cells with expected values of less than five, it can be an unreliable statistic. And you can see I've actually got that here. I've got an expected value of 4.2 for the males under 21, and I've got a, a 4.8 for the, 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 the males 21 and over. So you'd have to be a bit careful about using this, these particular figures. In fact, the example I'll show you will be different from that in a moment. <laughs> <laughs>